God has given his people a tremendous task in this world, and all need wisdom carefully to search out the mystery of iniquity. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. Testimonies to Ministers 118, and in Great Controversy 606 we read, the sins of Babylon will be laid open, the fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of papal power, all will be unmasked, and by these thousands who have never heard words like these before will be stirred. In the ancient world, the ancient system of pagan idolatry gave place to the monstrous cathedrals that exist in Europe today. But still on these cathedrals, we see remnants of the origin of this system. Spain reached a tremendous climax during the 15th and 16th century in her colonies around the world. And we see in Spain the great power of the Catholic Church. It was in Spain that the Inquisition was set up with a tremendous power. 68 million people were destroyed there alone. The early Christians had spent many years suffering at the hands of persecution, and as the church became corrupt, they separated. We find in the history of the Wallenses by Wiley and the Wallenses by Claudiana, a book written in Rome, that the early Christians who wanted to stay pure and stay faithful to the apostolic faith removed themselves into the mountains and the remote areas of Europe, and there they raised their families. But even there, the armies of Rome found them, the church was now the destroyer, and some of the most horrible scenes in the history of the world took place at that time. These people tried to have religious freedom. They worshipped in groves and trees and in caves of the earth, but even there the long arm of Rome found them. Their valleys were fairly silent just before the time of Martin Luther. But when they heard of the great reformation that was taking place in Germany and in Switzerland, they sent representatives and they joined the reformation and a tremendous movement took place against the power of Rome. And so Satan moved. In Great Controversy 234 we read, At this time the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery, cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affections, reason and conscious holy silence. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume. Vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to be developed to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, but under the blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable, but commendable when they served the interests of the church. In the power of the Jesuits by Fulip Miller and this book, The Jesuit, their spiritual doctrine and practice, we get a, 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 a history of the Jesuit order. We find that Inigo, the father of the order, was born in the Valley of Loyola, Loyola in northern Spain. Here he was born to a wealthy family. There today is a tremendous monastery to the Jesuits and a magnificent chapel illustrating how much they honored this man and the wealth of that order. The castle next to it is where Ignatius was born. Ignatius, as a young man, was a violent, brutish sort. The police records of the day said violent, vindictive, and dangerous. He was a proud young man and involved himself in many of the sins and evils of the day. He wanted to be a great commander. But unfortunately, in a, a battle with the French in Pamplona, he shattered his leg. And now his plans for the future as a great warrior were ended. There, while he was recuperating, he read books about the saints and about Jesus. These were fanciful books about the saints, about the miracles and the things they could do. He envisioned Christ as a great commander. And now he, as a saint, would capture the world for Jesus Christ. He had had a nervous breakdown, and this concept illustrated the condition that his mind was in. Now, as a cripple, he made his way all the way across Spain to the mountains of Montserrat. There was an ancient sanctuary there, and in that sanctuary was ha housed a very sacred image to the Catholic Church. This image was called the Black Virgin of Montserrat. 
In this church, Ignatius spent three days making confession and spent an entire night standing before this virgin statue as a, a knight in a vigil. He committed himself to the baby Jesus and to Mary. And from there he determined to go to Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem he determined that he would conquer the Muslim world for Jesus Christ. All the powers of Rome couldn't do it and now he would do it. On his way, he found he couldn't go because Barcelona had the plague. And so he had to stay in this little town called Monresa for ten months. There in that town, as we arrived there, we found a monstrous institution of the Jesuits built over the place where Ignatius stayed there. It was a cave. Ten months in the cave, he tortured his body and his mind until, in exhaustion, he began to have dreams and visions. He claimed that the secret doctrine of the Catholic Church was taught to him in this place. In his eye, he saw lights flashing. And he believed that Mary came in the form of a light in Jesus. And he believed that he saw Satan in a spiral of light eyes before him. He believed that he had chased Satan around like a dog with a stick and many other fanciful concepts, but he claimed that these teachings he received there were the foundation of his entire movement. And it's here he began the spiritual exercises of Ignatius. These were... Uh, experiences that a master Jesuit would bring novices through, would bring other people through to give them the same kind of mind that, that Ignatius developed through his experience. They were brought uh, through these experiences just like music on a sheet. For 30 days they were told what to think, how to feel, when to groan and when to sigh, what to imagine, and they were to cut off all normal human emotion throughout those experiences. Ignatius finally made his way to Jerusalem, but there the Franciscan monks told, him to, monks told him to go home. We don't want any political trouble here in the Muslim Empire. We've had enough of that. So making his way back to the port of Barcelona, Ignatius sat with little children learning the rudiments of Latin in order to study. From there he made his way to the little college in the town of Alcala, north of Madrid. Here at the Colegio Mayor, he began his studies in theology. While he was there, he gathered a little group of, of men and women around him and began to bring them through his mental exercises. They would faint and fall aside. They would scream and pass out. Friends, this is demonic activity that this man was involved in, even in his early history. Ignatius was known for the rest of his life for his mystic powers. In Occult Theocracy by Lady Queensborough and Secret Societies of All Ages by Hecathorn, we learned that at the time there was an organization called the Alumbrado or the Illuminati in Spain. The Inquisition determined that Ignatius had been a member of this occult intellectual society and threw him in the jail there at the Inquisition. Upon his release, he made his way to Salamanca, to the great university there, but again he was brought under suspicion of being an Illuminist and he was thrown in the Inquisition again. Now, upon being released, he made his way to the great University of Paris in France, and there he gathered intelligent young men around him, brought them under the control of the power of his mind, and these became the basis of his society. Not too far from the university, they dedicated themselves to the new order of the Jesuits there in Montmartre. Today there's a tremendous chapel on Montmartre, one of the most magnificent chapels that we saw while we were in Europe. And it's dedicated to the destruction of democracy and liberty in the world. Ignatius from there made his way to Rome and in time he was accepted by the Pope. The Reformation had destroyed the influence of the church in many parts of Europe. In the book, The Ignatian Fireworks or Fiery Jesuits, published in 1667, it's right here in the vaults at PUC if you want to read it, we read the aged gentleman Paul III, who then sat in the infallible chair, foreseeing the need, of, need the papacy had of incendiaries to vex the enemies to its grandeur, easily grants the petition of Ignatius and his decimures prostrate at His Holiness's feet, where after sweet kisses and token of their obedience, they receive an institution of their predominant sect. From that time, Rome was the center 
of this new satanic system, the Jesuit order. This is the Chiesa del Gesù in Rome. And entering into it, we get some idea of the wealth and the power of the Society of Jesus. There, a death mask of Loyola was made into a picture. We get a view of what he looked like. But the altars and the artwork are the ancient Baroque style, and it's a magnificent structure showing that the wealth of the nations at one time flowed into this order. There's an allegorical statue of the church destroying Huss and Luther. Another great painting of Ignatius ascending to heaven as a saint after his death. But the most interesting of all to me was this, of Jesus holding his heart out in his hand. It was the, the uh, followers of Ignatians that brought into the church the mystical teachings and the worship of Mary in the heart and brought those mystical teachings of the Dark Ages into the 20th century. When Xavier, ex, when Xavier was once requested by one of the patients to scrape out an abscess, this is Xavier, one of, uh, one of Ignatius' followers, he felt rather squeamish about it. He put his hand, which was covered with a purulent matter, to his mouth in order to put his self-control to the extreme test. It's amazing that even at that early time, these men had minds that controlled their emotions. Rodriguez would not at first make use of this resting place, but afterwards, in order to punish himself for his weakness, he laid himself down naked in a bed in which immediately before a man had died of pediculosis and which still swarmed with vermin. These men, with their mind over the control of their emotions, were sent out into the world. At first, they proved themselves in the hospitals, and that's where these quotations came from in Philip Miller's book, History of the Jesuits. But they also made their way out into the world of the pagans to win them to the new pagan Christianity. One of the first was St. Francis Xavier. The Pope claimed that this man had been given the gift of tongues, and as he went out, he certainly learned scores and scores of languages in India and Asia and Japan and became a master of that whole province in the Jesuit system. The Jesuits were given tremendous power. At first, there was only 60 of them allowed, but in time, they were given full control of the church. Yea, they were given power to excommunicate all who would hinder or do not aid the society, to confer orders, preach and minister sacraments, to change their general, to, to change their general, to absolve heretics as well as imprison the excommunicate to exercise episcopal functions, to confirm, exercise, dispense, etc., to disguise themselves, to carry movable altars, give plenary indulgence, to live exempt, free from secular power, taxes, as well as juris jurisdiction, authority, sentence, and command of any other ordinary delegate, judge, magistrate, from any search. Folks, it illustrates that the church and society gave the Jesuit absolute control in this world, total free from all law. In the Council of Trent, two of them were set aside, Alcazar and Ribera, to form a counterfeit theology to the prophecy of the Protestants about the Antichrist. At that time, these theologians formed the idea of futurism, that the Antichrist should come sometime in the future. This in time developed through Don John Darby and Edward Irving in Scotland into the rapture concept. And this book on the rapture was written by two Catholic priests. Peter Canisus and Peter Faber were the first missionaries sent in to form an educational system in Germany to counter the Reformation. The Jesuits became the educators and the controllers of the mind of children and the generations that were coming up. They became the great moral theologians and fought the Protestant concept of...